Throughout Minecraft's history, there has existed an extremely rare and powerful type of exploit, allowing you to gain admin or op status on any Minecraft server and absolutely destroy them. Force op exploits as they are known are extremely elusive and in the rare circumstances real ones come to be known, they make waves in the Minecraft community. From stealing players session IDs by making them log into your server, faking server plugins, exploiting game mechanics, ancient hacks and mods in deleted threads on old hack forums and huge Mojang oversights that made every single Minecraft account vulnerable, the few force op exploits that have come to exist in the game's 15 years are not only extremely powerful but hidden and mostly forgotten. Today we'll be talking about the story behind some of Minecraft's most powerful force op exploits. Way back in 2011, during Minecraft beta and when Minecraft servers weren't nearly as secure, griefing was much more of a possibility. But beyond that, there was some insane, untapped social engineering potential as server owners were newer and very inexperienced. Enter a channel known as I Can Has Grief, an old Minecraft griefing channel similar to Team Avalition. In September of 2011, I Can Has Grief would upload a video titled How to Become Admin on Almost Any Minecraft Server Without Hacks. The video, now with over 4.4 million views, an insane amount for the time, displays one of the stupidest, but also first, force op methods Minecraft would ever see. Say, I'm a, I review servers. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, we need oh my god, I review servers. I want to say I work for Planet Minecraft. God do it. Why, why do you think they're going to give you out? Oh. Because he's saying that he reviews servers. Oh, that's genius. Wait, are you getting access, dude? Yeah. Yep, that's right. All you had to do was join a server, say you were from Planet Minecraft, the largest Minecraft forum and hub at the time, and there was an above 50% chance that the server owner would believe you and hand you up on a silver platter. Now I know this sounds incredibly stupid, but what you have to understand is that 13 years ago, nobody was doing things like this, server owners were not at all prepared. And not only that, but server owners were just less experienced in general. Back then, servers would just run off people's home computers, it wasn't near as established as it is today. The method apparently had a 60% success rate working on 3 out of 5 servers Icon has grief and his friends tried it on, and he showcases that in his video. To improve his odds, he also bought the Minecraft account named Planet Minecraft, which likely made him extremely believable. Just look at these chat reactions. And after the video was uploaded and went viral, for years after, it was common to see other players try it on servers, which it likely worked on for a very brief period of time. Over time though, it became so well known that nobody would fall for it anymore, eventually becoming a mere joke within the Minecraft community that for the most part has now been forgotten. Now, only a few months later, in April of 2012, the Minecraft community had rapidly undergone development, the game had blown up in popularity, fully released, and server owners were much more wary. This is arguably where one of the first true force op exploits came to exist, the Nodus Session Stealer. For those of you newer to the game, the words Nodus might be insignificant, but anybody who played Minecraft in the earlier 2010s will recognize it as one of the most famous Minecraft hack clients to ever exist, and the reason players used to say, don't join servers you don't trust. In Minecraft's earlier versions, such as 1.0.0, 1.1 .1 and 1.2, whenever you joined a server, the server would be able to temporarily set your session ID to zero. A session ID is the game's way of ensuring it's actually you on the Minecraft account. It's a string of random numbers and letters and should not be given out to anyone. So as I mentioned, due to the way Minecraft servers used to work, servers had the ability to change player session IDs to zero temporarily. And now that they knew a player's session ID, they could log in as them onto other servers. The creator of Notice Hack Client, Sketch, would create an automated tool for this that would allow you to select a target server you wanted op on and set the commands it would execute. It would then make another server that people could join. The goal was to get a player who was op on a server to join this fake server, which would then disconnect them immediately and would allow Notice to get the op player's session ID and would therefore log in as them on the server you wanted op on and execute the command to op the player without the actual server operator even realizing. 
Technically, it didn't steal the session ID, as Dinnerbone would clarify on a Reddit post, but tricked your client into a one-time authentication that the hackers could use to join any server just once and execute commands, which is what Notice did automatically. Back in 2012, a lot of servers at the time were smaller, and as such, it would be common to befriend server admins and owners and play on multiple servers with them. Notice Session Stealer even allowed you to spoof players, making the server look even more legitimate. It was much easier to get ops to join your server to try it out or to test it, so this method was extremely effective before it would inevitably be patched. One trick players used at the time was telling server owners that another server had copied their spawn and getting them to join to check. You can see there are a variety of forum posts from 2012 warning players and telling them not to join servers they don't trust, as well as people mentioning them or their friend's servers had been griefed. Session stealer force op methods still exist today, although the methods of stealing a player's Minecraft login session have changed. You've probably seen the Discord ones. Most session stealers today also don't try to get op on servers as most server owners know better, but instead try to access players accounts to steal their Hypixel Skyblock gold for example. Back in mid-2012, when Minecraft account migration first happened, no, not Microsoft account migration, but Mojang account migration, there was a gigantic oversight leading to an exploit. Basically, as reported by Sirenfall, a member of the famous griefing group Team Avalition, back when Minecraft accounts first migrated to Mojang accounts, there was a significant oversight in server authentication. As we just talked about, if you stole a player's session ID, you could basically log in as them. But back in 2012, if you had a migrated Minecraft account session ID, such as your own account session ID, you could store that ID and then log in with any username you wanted, and rather than check if the session ID was in fact that account session ID, the server authentication would only check if the session ID was a valid ID. There was a failure to validate the ownership of a Mojang migrated account's session ID. So, you could use your own Minecraft account session ID to log in as any migrated Minecraft account, allowing you to of course log in as operators and to get op. While Team Avo were the ones to report this, they did in fact use it to grief a few servers with op and it was an extremely powerful exploit. It was patched relatively quickly, but hilariously, wouldn't be the only time such an exploit would happen. Fast forward to 2020 and a very similar exploit method was discovered. This time it affected all Minecraft accounts, not just Mojang migrated ones, and worked like so. Instead of using Mojang's modern server join authentication API, you could use the legacy authentication API, which instead of checking if the session ID token was actually owned by that account, would just check if it was valid. It wasn't that hard either, as all you had to do to use the legacy authentication API instead of the modern modern one was install a mod, in fact the original bug reporter even modified a popular forge mod called reauth to do just that, changing it to only require a username as well. This time the exploit was used to not only grief servers as an op, but to steal Hypixel Skyblock coins, troll YouTubers who were streaming, find bases on 2b2t, and much much more, before it was eventually patched. It was overwhelmingly powerful that's for sure. And on the topic of session IDs, years ago Minecraft crash reports used to contain session IDs in them. Players used to therefore search the forums and internet or actually ask server operators who send them a crash report, get their session ID and then they could log in as you on any server including ones you were op on. Alright, so we've talked a lot about four stop methods that are now all patched, but what about one which was found way back in 2013 and still technically works to this day? Well, that method is of course the subscribe for stop method, where clicking the subscribe button allows you to gain OP, otherwise known as overpowered status, no pressure of course. Also, be sure to check out my Patreon for exclusive content I've never released anywhere else. Anyways, that's where we introduce what's known as bungee spoofing. This one's pretty technical, so I'll try to break it down as simply as possible. Basically, many Minecraft servers use this Minecraft plugin called Bungie Cord. It's a plugin which allows you to link servers together. For example, a hub server, a survival server, a bedwars lobby, and much, much more. That's how all modern servers work nowadays, when you go from their hub to their minigames or game modes. Bungie spoofing is where you take advantage of the fact that a significant number of servers have poorly configured Bungie cord or a poorly configured server network and firewall. Without getting too technical, in order to use Bungie cord, your servers have to be running in offline mode as Bungie cord acts as a server proxy that validates the logins instead and is the only server which is in online mode. As I'm sure you know, servers in offline mode, otherwise known as cracked servers, need authentication plugins to ensure that players don't log in as other players since they are using pirated 
with Minecraft. If you have a poorly configured bungee cord or server network, players can bypass the bungee cord and therefore log into your server, which is in offline mode as any username they want, including server operators. They do this by scanning your server's ports to look for servers which are not publicly known, but are publicly exposed or open and not properly configured or protected by the server's firewall. An example of this could be a test or development server, which only these server's admins can join that has a different port that nobody knows. Technically, this is known as UUID spoofing. The other method, which is what bungee spoofing is more typically referred to, is where malicious players trick bungee cord by running a bungee cord server themselves. If a server is poorly configured and has all of its ports open, you can scan the network to figure out what their bungee cord config is. Players can then replicate the config file of a server's bungee cord and then run it locally on their own PC. Then, once you run the bungee cord server off your computer locally, you can log in as whatever account you want and use the slash server command to connect to the server's actual game modes as a server operator. Bungie spoofing and UUID spoofing are pretty old methods now and as such any established server is aware of it and this setup properly so it isn't possible. But you'd be surprised at how many newer servers there are where bungee spoofing has been possible for extended periods of time. In fact, my very own server og-network.net was bungee spoofed way back in 2022 where a player logged in as me and set their accounts to owner to grief our server but we caught it before they were able to grief luckily and now configured everything properly. Regardless, it's an interesting full swap method as it's one of the only ones that still generally works even today. Back in September of 2013, there was a super underground force op exploit known as the Handshake Exploit. I have to give a huge shout out to Guildfesh for telling me about this one. He also helped me out with some other force ops in this video, as there's virtually no other information online about this anywhere besides a now deleted hack forums thread. Basically, for a very brief period of time in September 2013, there was a bizarre login exploit where you could start a server login process with a real account, send a second login with any username you wanted, and then quickly cancel the login. If timed correctly, you could log in as whatever account you wanted, even ones that didn't exist. Here is the only known screenshot of the mod used to do this from an old archived hacked forums thread. In the top left, you would put in the name you wanted to log in as, and then in the right, you would put the delete. Delay. Basically, what would happen is you would send a request or handshake request to the server to log in with your normal account, and then almost immediately a second request or handshake would be sent with the victim's username. You'd get a response saying the first was valid, but the second wasn't, but you'd still be let in using the second name. This happens because of a race condition, which is a situation in a program's code where the program tries to do two different things at the same time, but both operations need to be done in a proper sequence to be done correctly. What happens here is that you need to get your second username login request in before the first one is accepted, and if done right, it will let you join before the second request has been denied. There is very little information about this, as I mentioned, but in Minecraft 1.0, 6.4, released about 10 days after the hack forums post was made, they did mention a handshake exploit was fixed, proving it was in fact legit. In 2014, two force-op exploit methods were unknowingly introduced by Mojang themselves. In Minecraft 1.8, signs were given the ability to execute commands by right-clicking them. But there was a huge oversight in this, in that the commands were run at the same permission level as the console, but the game did not check if the player had permission to place a sign with specific data on them or not. So, using hack clients such as Worst, players could log onto a server, make a sign, enable the sign force op module, and write the command they wanted to execute, place the sign, right click it, and get op that easily. This method only worked on vanilla Minecraft servers at the time, but back in 2014 and 2015, vanilla servers were much more common, and as such it was a pretty powerful exploit, especially due to how easy it was. In a similar vein, in 1.8, dispensers were given the ability to not just dispense, but also place command blocks. You could of course therefore dispense and place a command block with NBT data or commands already in it. Up until Minecraft 1.8.5, any player in creative mode could get a command block with NBT data in it, place it and activate it with no op required. This method did require creative mode, but creative plot servers were much more popular around this time and as such it was still an effective way of getting op. This was patched in Minecraft 1.8.5, non-opt players could no longer place command blocks and signs with NBT data, but dispensers still could. So 
so for one very brief update, players could still use this method, using dispensers to place command blocks with NBT data instead. This would be patched in 1.8.6 and was actually an extremely controversial update, more on that in my video about it here though. A similar method which also worked in 1.8 but wasn't as powerful was known as the book hack. Book hack allowed you to make text in books execute commands when clicked and if done with a hacked client such as worst, nobody would be able to tell the commands were inserted. So here's how it worked. You would write a book and give it to a server op or admin. In the book would be some sort of social engineering method of getting the admin to click the text in the book. So for example, pretending to link to a YouTube video with a trailer showing off the server. However, without realizing, the admin would have just executed a command and you could of course set that command to op you. As I mentioned, it was more of a social engineering method than anything, but once again, back in 2014 and 2015, was much, much easier to pull off. Now, you may have noticed that besides session ID exploits and vulnerabilities, since roughly 2015, there haven't really been any notable force op exploits. Almost all of the exploits we've talked about thus far were only a thing in the game's earlier years. And that's because entering the later 2010s and 2020s, Minecraft servers became bigger with dedicated teams run more like businesses by experienced players, smaller servers decreased in number, and the market for Minecraft servers got very difficult to enter, leaving only the more knowledgeable. Not only that, but plugins and server-side software began rapidly developing as well. Thus, the likelihood a force op exploit would come to be only became more and more unlikely, making force op exploits more and more elusive. About two months ago now, one of the most powerful force op exploits ever would be found. I made an entire 30 minute video about it here, but to summarize, an exploit was found in the popular anti-cheat plugin known as Vulkan, allowing any player to configure the plugin in game. By renaming two chests to the same name of the Vulkan plugin's GUIs, any player on the server was able to access a special menu where you could enable and disable the anti-cheat's various checks, a menu which normally only server admins can access. But importantly, you could set the anti-cheat's various flags and checks to execute specific commands when specific anti-cheat modules were flagged. For example, you could set it to slash opu when the check for an auto-clicker was flagged. Two big oversights, one being the ability to open the anti-cheat's GUI without any permissions, and number two being the plugin allowing players to configure the anti-cheat's checks without checking if they had the right permissions. Because of how popular Vulkan is, this force op exploit was present on many of the game's biggest servers and even executed its commands at a console level. It was ultra powerful. However, after not even a day, the exploit was patched, although it didn't stop us from participating in a little griefing. And finally today, we have technically a Java exploit, not a Minecraft force op exploit, but a method which allows you to force op regardless, and that was the log4j security vulnerability. You've probably heard of this before, but back in December 2021, a critical vulnerability was discovered in a logging library in Java applications, which of course includes Minecraft servers. Basically, this vulnerability allowed players to remotely execute specific code by simply sending just this message here in chat. This exploit went beyond just gaining op, as you could literally gain access to a person's computer and much much more, but of course could be used to force op on any server and utterly destroy it. And that about wraps it up, be sure to check out my Patreon for exclusive content never released before, be sure to subscribe, thank you all so much for watching.